Welcome back to Giant Monster Games. I'm Adrian, and today, by popular request, we are doing Budget Urzatron deck. Now, this deck is running in around $90, which is a little bit above my normal budget for budget decks. Normally, I want to keep them in the, like, $40 to $60, $70 range, but this is as low as I could possibly get it to keep that big budget, fast, aggressive Tron deck feel. Let's jump straight in, talking about what is Urzatron. Urzatron is the combination of three different cards, Urza's Power Plant, Urza's Mine, and Urza's Tower. Individually, these cards only produce one colorless mana each, but if you have one of each of these types of cards on the battlefield, they produce a total of seven mana, Power Plant and Mine producing two mana each, Tower producing three. So this is why it's referred to as Urzatron, because it's kind of like Voltron, where once they're all combined, they create a giant robot, which generally can smash our opponent in the face. Okay, they don't actually create a giant robot, but they do give us seven mana, which we can use to summon something that is equivalent to a giant robot. While we're here, I should probably mention we're running play sets of each of these cards, so four mines, four power plants, and four towers. And seeing how we're on the subject of land, let's just finish up our mana base. Nothing else too special, only eight forests and a single lonely mountain. Moving over to spells, or most of the artifacts actually, we have four copies of Expedition Map. This is a key pillar to this deck because Expedition Map allows us to go and fetch any land, which means we can go and fetch whichever piece of the Urzatron land we don't currently have. This is generally your best first turn play because if you have this in your opening hand, along with two other Urza lands, different ones obviously, you can guarantee have untapped Urzatron on turn three. But Expedition Map is not the only card we have that fetches up any land. We also have four copies of Sylvan Scrying, which is almost the same thing as Expedition Map. It allows us to fetch up any of our missing combo pieces, except it costs green mana to cast this. As you may have already noticed, the Urza lands don't produce green mana, which means either we need to play a forest, which slows us down by a turn, or we need to find another trick on how to play this card, which takes me to our next card. Four copies of Explore. Now this card allows us to play an additional land the turn we play it. We also get to draw an extra card, so cantripping is always nice. An example series of plays, on turn one we play an Urza land, anything, and cast maybe any of our one-drop artifacts, which I'll cover in a second. Turn two we play a forest, we can play explore, which means we play a second Urza land. Then on turn three we can play Sylvan Scrying to fetch up our last Urza land we need, and complete Tron. Obviously we'll be down by at least one Urza land, so we'll only have five open mana, but it does open up some possibilities because we do have a four drop that is super handy. Now, I know what I just described sounds super janky, so let's talk about how we actually go about making green or any colored mana in this deck, and that is with our next series of one-drop artifacts. We have four copies of Chromatic Sphere, two copies of Chromatic Star, and three copies of Terrarium. Now, all of these cards are almost identical. They each have their own little differences to them, but they all provide us mana fixing, so we can convert our colorless Urza mana into whatever color we want. Generally gonna be green, and they all have cantrips, so we can use them to draw cards and play Fine Tron, or draw up our win conditions. The actual ideal play would be to play one of these on turn one, turn two, crack it, cast Sylvan Scrying, and then turn three, you have Tron again. But wait, there's more! The next card we have is two copies of Ancestral Stirrings. Now this is kind of a toolbox card in this deck because it allows us to look at the top five cards of our deck and put a colorless card into our hand. So that could be a land because all lands are colorless or one of our artifacts or better yet, one of our win conditions. In summary, this card can be played early game or late game with value no matter what time you play it. And the last non-creature we're going to talk about is Cryolus Vault. We're running two copies of this and it is replacing Oblivion Stone. The Oblivion Stone is really expensive, it is going to be in the upgrade section, you'll see that in a second. But this allows us to wipe the board, so if we're against any kind of aggro strategy, any kind of mid-range strategy, combo decks, this allows us to completely wipe the board and then start over. Usually we're playing this when we already have Tron. Wipe the board and then start playing our giant creatures to win the game. Which seems like a perfect segue to talk about about said giant creatures. The first one we have is four copies of Bane of Balaged. Now this is the most vanilla win condition we have, and it also feels the most like an actual Tron deck card that you would actually normally see, because it is an Eldrazi, it is colorless, it costs seven mana, it is a seven five, which means when it swings in it's gonna do some serious damage, and it has the equivalent of Annihilator. It doesn't actually have the Annihilator keyword because they didn't reprint that in Battle for Zendikar, but it is the exact same ability, which is whenever it attacks, defending player exiles two permanents he or she controls. Which as you can guess can easily close up the game if this creature attacks once or twice because your opponent will have almost no board state left and potentially even be losing lands. 
Carrying on, our next creature is Steel Hellkite, which is basically the giant robot I was talking about. We're running four copies of this guy, and it is a 5-5 flyer for six mana, which is awesome in itself, but it has a ton of upside. So one, you can pay two mana to make it bigger, give it plus one, plus zero oh until end of turn, but that's not the real reason why we're playing it. Its second ability is why it's in this deck, because it is crazy, which is whenever we swing in an attack with Steel Hellkite and it deals damage to a player, we may pay X mana and then destroy each permanent our opponent controls with converted mana cost X, whatever we paid. We can only do this once per turn, so we can't use it to completely wipe our opponent's board, but we can definitely use it to control our opponent so they can't get the advantage on us. If we need to go wide, we have Mir Battle Spear. We're running four copies of this guy, and it is another robot for us because it is an artifact feature. I guess that's a robot if you consider it that way. It is a 4-7-4-7 by itself, but when it enters the battlefield, we create four 1-1 one, one colorless Mir tokens which is fantastic. We're getting tons of value right there. Plus, whenever Mir Battle Spear attacks, we may tap any number of mirrors we have and give it plus X plus O, which is the number of mirrors we tap. Plus, it deals that much damage to our opponent. So you can see it has tons of utility. I'm sure you can find ways of making this card work very well for you. Our last creature, though, is two copies of World Breaker. Now this guy tends to be another utility card for us. So not only is he a 5-7 for 7, he also has the Persian we can sacrifice a land to bring him out of our graveyard back into our hand. So he's really hard for our opponent to kill if we do get into our graveyard. His main ability, which is why we have him in the deck, is whenever we cast him, we may exile target artifact, enchantment, or land. So we can use this to slow down other Tron decks. We can use this to slow down basically any deck that's running dual lands because we can target their least abundant land. We can also use this post sideboard to hopefully destroy stuff like Stony Silence or other cards that are going to give us a hard time because generally they tend to be artifacts or enchantments. So as you can see, it has tons of utility. I do want to point out before we actually wrap up our creature section that all of these creatures are seven or less mana to cast. Because we're not playing giant Eldrazi like Emrakul and Ulamog, which almost win you the game as soon as they come into play, I made it so this deck is low to the ground in relative terms for Tron, that is, and we can generally be casting these creatures for their mana cost on turn 5 if we do get locked out and they destroy one of our Tron lands and remove it from our deck. So we're not completely out of the game if we do lose one of our combo pieces. We can still get these creatures out of the board relatively fast and still be a threat even if we're not getting Tron. Now let's talk about our sideboard. The first card we have is three copies of Crumble to Dust. This is helping us deal with other Tron decks. It also kind of helps us with Ad Nauseam, Scape Shift, and any decks that are running three or more colors. Not necessarily an auto-include when you're going to be sideboarding, but it is something to keep in mind. Probably auto-include if it's Tron, actually. The next card we have is two copies of Fog. This is kind of self-explanatory. Then we have four copies of Nature's Claim. This is obviously targeting cards like Stony Silence, Pithing Needle, or any other card that's going to give us a hard time and not let us get Tron as fast as possible. This also gives us a little bit of hate for any deck that's running largely artifacts, so Lantern Control or Affinity. Then we have four copies of Pyroplasm. This is generally our aggro control spell. We're using this to wipe the board of creatures, usually. And last but not least, we have Ravenous Trap. We have two copies of this, and it's helping us deal with Dredge and some combo decks that rely on stuff going to the and then coming back over repeatedly. Example being the Heartless Mirror deck I did a few weeks ago back. That is the entire deck, but before we wrap up this video, let's talk about some upgrades. The first and easiest upgrade for this deck is to pull out all three copies of Terrarion and putting in two more copies of Chromatic Star and an additional Ancestral Stirring. I largely used Terrarion because it was a much version of these cards, but the other cards are just substantially better. Oblivion Stone is a direct upgrade for Priorless Vault and is actually faster and better at dealing with exit threats. The next few cards are all replacing our win conditions. The first one is Worm Coil Engine. This one here generally finds its way into most Tron decks because it has lifelink and death touch. And and when it dies, not necessarily if it gets exiled, but when it dies, it actually creates two 3-3 three, three creatures, one with lifelink and one with death touch. So it becomes really hard to just straight up kill this creature. The next two cards we have are Karn Liberated and Ugin the Spirit Dragon. Both of these cards have the ability to exile permanents. Karn has the ability to exile lands even, which is crazy. Their other abilities are also absolutely insane. Ugin being able to deal damage directly to creatures or your opponent, and Karn being able to destroy your opponent's hand. Once these guys get on the table, it becomes very hard for your opponent to deal with you. And lastly, we have the two cards that tend to be the poster child for Tron decks, Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunger, and Emrakul, the Aeons Torn. Ulamog being one, indestructible, two, when it comes into play, you exile two permanents, and three, whenever it attacks, your opponent puts the top 20 cards of their library into their graveyard. Literally, he can attack three times, and your opponent is guaranteed to be dead. And Emrakul may as well just read, you win the game, because it is uncounterable. When you cast it, you take an extra turn. It has protection from colored spells, and you can't cast it, or any, you can't do anything to it. It also has flying and annihilation. 6, so when it attacks, your opponent has to exile 6 permanents, and if it's for some reason put into your graveyard somehow, it gets shuffled back into your library, so you can just kind of search it up again. It's absolutely insane.
And that concludes our Budget Tron deck. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to Giant Monster Games. Until next time, I'm Adrian, this is Giant Monster Games, and don't forget to game like a giant monster. Giant Monster Games, I'm Adrian, and today we are playing Budget Tron. And what do I think we'll do? And we have Strarion, we don't have any of our combo pieces, we are going to mulligan. Not a terrible hand, but it's not amazing. And this, this is keepable. We will be trying to keep it. Let's see what's out now. Main of Balaget, I think I would rather put that on the bottom, because... Um, because we definitely need to get Tron before we're ever going to cast that. And we're playing a mirror match. Neat. Okay, well, that's something to keep in mind. And it is our turn. So, tower, spear, go. And we'll see what our opponent does. So our opponent clearly is not playing the budget version of this. He's playing an Eldrazi Temple. Which means he is not going to be getting out Tron on turn 3, very likely. Thanks. Much of you're telling me I should free up some storage space in my virtual storage machine. I guess I probably actually need to do this. Hmm, the second Eldrazi Temple. That's... very difficult. Well, not playing It is completely possible. Um, he, on the other hand, will play... our Sylvan Scrying right away here. Um... Might as well save this no, I shouldn't. I, don't, I have no reason to actually save this. Um, I have every mana, sure, but uh, there's no reason to not play it. Uh, no, someone's trying for the next piece of Tron. Yeah, someone's trying for the next piece of Tron is probably a better bet than Exploration Map. Yeah. I'm just trying to think whether it's better to play my Extra Forest and draw a card and hopefully get something good and maybe getting another one drop. What is our opponent playing? He is playing Exploration. Exploration map. No worries. And we have a tower already, so let's grab a mine. Because the minor power plant is <laughs> our only two real options. Uh, and turn. And what is our opponent doing? Stretched up, I totally forgot to look at what he was fetching up. Because I was slowly adding to that I was on turn three. Um, so let's see what our opponent is playing. I'm. My initial reaction is Tom, so we thought the temple was popular in Tron. Is this straight up Eldrazi? Maybe it is. Straight up Eldrazi. I, I, I apologize. I actually don't feel like I know what I'm playing against here. It's kind of weird. We're waiting for our opponent to do something. And it is our turn, and we drew another tower. It's not terrible, but it's not actually what we want. So we can kick out our mine, and we have two options. We can either Ancestral Stirring, flip the top five cards of our deck, and Hopefully we'll get something that's worth playing. Yeah, let's do that. Um, obviously I already played my mind, but that's okay. So we're going to take a look at the top five cards of our deck, and hopefully find something of use in there. Waiting for our opponent, and we do have a power plant. Let's take that. Hit OK, and unfortunately, and these can go back in whatever order. And unfortunately, we're not going to be able to play it this turn because we need an additional green mana. But we can play at least our Chromatic Sphere and then next turn we can play it. So next turn we'll have Tron and we'll probably play the Mirror Battle Sphere. So it's okay. So we, we're, we're one turn behind on our Master Plan, which... It's actually really surprising. Usually Tron is very consistent. Uh, like turn three, let's say like this, for this deck specifically, probably 60 to 70 percent of the time we can have Tron on turn three. Um, there's, there's so many different ways of us getting it. Uh, it doesn't always happen that way. And our opponent is going to. Ooh, that is good for us because he is killing the one piece that we have a redundant amount in our hand, which I am very grateful for. <laughs> He's obviously killing it. It's kind of like the best bet usually to build the tower because it produces 3 mana, and we also got our own world breaker. So, let's see, 
let's play our explore right now. We will be robbed before we start playing land. We go to the forest, so we have a ton of land. And unfortunately, we're not going to actually be able to play. We're not actually going to be able to play any of our big awesome features this turn. Which kind of sucks. What, what else can we do? We have five open mana. I think this is very good. Might as well. Actually, you know what we can do? I This isn't necessarily the best idea. Because we have green mana, there's no point in actually kicking around the chromatic star. So we may as well crack it right now and draw a card. So hopefully, and another power plant, which is cool. Um, and unfortunately, we're just going to skip our turn. I was hoping to draw into uh, any of our artifacts, our, like, uh, more spheres or stars or anything like that. And then just to get a little bit more stuff onto the table. Ideally, just milling our deck through and finding more value rather than uh, just sitting on the top. Our opponent is Ancestral Strings again. We can play another... Oh, Ghost Porters. Uh, our opponent has all of the hate for our deck right now. It's very annoying. Yep. Yep. Um, we will go fetch up a land. Yes, I would like to fetch a land with Ghost Quarters. Thank you. And I drew a Steel Hellcade. Because it is our turn. Well then, what do we do here? What do we do? We have... We're going to slowly die here from uh, a variety of things. Actually, take over my graveyard because our opponent's going to start making stuff right away here. Uh, so we might as well play our power plant. And we need to ship the turn, unfortunately. Uh, next turn, though, we can play our Steel Hell Kate, which will help us quite a bit. Because we'll play Steel Hell Kate next turn. And assuming nothing bad happens to it, we'll actually swing in and we'll actually be able to exile his uh, World Breaker uh, the turn after, because we'll have 7 mana at that point. That's the one upside about having a ton of land in this deck. Or having a ton of land in our hand right now, I should say. Nahiri. That's going to make our life a lot more difficult. Uh, yeah? Okay. Exile to our graveyard. Discard a card. Discard a card. Sure, that's not good. I directed it outside. I directed that opponent. It's totally fine. Totally fine by me. Um, I think their opponent's gonna swing into our face for five damage. So we are slowly losing this battle. Uh, we get three game battle. So our options are. What is her other ability? Exile target, can't mix cast artifact or cast Okay, so our two options are either play Steel Hellkite or play Pryless Vault. And our play, play Pryless Vault. Play Pryless Vault. Because, uh, we obviously won't be able to trigger it off this turn, but next turn we'll actually fire it off and we'll wipe Worldbreaker, Nahiri, Nahiri, and something else. Um, and Nahiri can't destroy it because it needs to be a tapped artifact. So this is kind of an interesting build they have going on here, so it's... I obviously, we haven't seen very much, but it's very kind of like a Tron shell without Tron in it. I'm assuming it's largely just an Eldrazi build. Well, I mean, Ulabog being in the deck is kind of shows that it's kind of an Eldrazi build. And uh, at this point, I think we just need to concede. I don't think there's any way for us to win. At we'll, we'll see what we draw, but I'm guaranteeing you that we are about to die. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. We will find something else to play. Uh, sideboard, something that'll hopefully hate on some of this land that he has going on here, that's his Eldrazi Temple specifically. And what do we draw? Do we draw anything that's going to help us out? That is not going to help us out. So okay, so we're going to concede this match, or this game I should say, and then we are going to side in some stuff to hopefully deal with this deck. So obviously siding in three Crumble the Dusts, which I just put in here, uh, because this deck that we're playing against relies on special lands. Um, I don't see them relying on Graveyard, we're not seeing small creatures. Nature's Claim may be a good option, so I'm going to throw two of them in. Because, and, do I want to throw Fog in? No, I think I'd rather focus on rushing our opponent rather than, I think we can lose two mere Battle Spheres. We don't need necessarily need to go wide. We can go wide to win, but I think going wide is not going to be the best bet for us in this exact case. Um, Explore is going to be fine. We need to find three other cards. 